Oh, oh, sorry. There we go. Before we get started, just a few Zoom practicalities. Please ensure that your microphones are muted. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can indicate this in the chat and the moderators will invite you to ask your questions um, and unmute you um, uh, when the discussion and Q&A section takes place, which is after our presentations. And when you do um, ask your question, please uh, turn on mute after you've asked your question. So um, uh, please note again that this meeting will be recorded and available online through um, APEC Ghana's website and social media platforms such as YouTube and Facebook. And if you do not want your name or video to be visible because we are recording this, um, just make sure you turn off your video and make your name anonymous, um, uh, only first name or initials or um, a pseudonym. So just a little bit about tonight, our guest speaker will be speak for 20 minutes and our patient speakers are allotted around 10 minutes to present. Um, our speakers are encouraged to stick to the time allotted, um, but we will be monitoring the time um, privately. Um, our guest speaker will introduce us technically to the subject and her research uh, work on the subject. And the patient speakers will provide a detailed narrative um, on the clinical care they received during their pregnancies, as well as their maternal journey. Um, and as Koiwa describes, the good, the bad, the ugly, and any interventions experienced or suggested. So we just, um, so again, sorry, I forgot to put this up. But yeah, so again, so this is kind of the agenda for today. Brief welcome by me, PhD in the SPOT study. Um, introduction of speakers. Um, we have the patient speakers who speak. And then we have our guest speaker. Um, and then we have discussion and Q&A. So again, continue to write your questions in the chat and we will compile them, um, but there will also be opportunity to ask uh, questions directly of the panelists. So it's kind of the first thing we wanted to do to kind of as an icebreaker and get everyone started um, and, and use the chat box for this, um, just some questions. Um, you can answer one, you can answer all, you don't have to answer um, any of them, but it's just to kind of get us familiar with each other and kind of see um, where we're at. So one of the first questions is where are you in the world right now, city or country? Um, another question is, uh, what do you hope to learn from today's webinar series? And the third question is, what are some topics and concepts you associate with respectful maternity care? So I'm just going to give like a few minutes for people to um, just maybe one or two minutes for people to to answer those questions in the chat. Um, I've already seen people from Ghana, from the Netherlands, from Michigan in the States. I'm seeing some physicians, midwives. I see some communication and research associates. Physician assistant intern. And I see someone answered um, the third question. Uh, respectful maternity care from MDOC uh, healthcare. Respectful to maternity care means seeing every woman as deserving of quality health care, irrespective of their social, economic, or demographic status. And we have another one from Benjamin. Respectful mother, mother care, maternal care leads to better emotional health for mother and baby. A few more minutes for people to answer the questions.
Brecchia wants to learn about how about what women in Ghana feel is key to respectful care. We have part of MDOC head of programs in Nigeria. Um, hear how women feel their patient experience and patient-centered care. Abdul wants to learn the experiences of others on the topic, what the concept can be adopted to, to enhance my care. So related to professional development, wonderful. Although we know this is an accredited uh, webinar. And Julia says, I'm looking forward to learning more about how respectful maternity care influences the quality of care, wonderful. Continue to answer these questions in the chat, but I think we're gonna get started with our presenters. So first on the docket, sorry, excuse me. I think um, just, I'm going to exit from, I'll just actually keep it on this slide, um, unless Koi, what you think think otherwise. Um, I, um, so our first speaker today is, um, sorry, Augustina Mensa Ephraim. So welcome, Augustina. So she is a mother of five, three boys and two girls. She is a dental surgery assistant at the University of Ghana Dental School and runs the NGO Perfect Smile Foundation, an oral health organization that organizes oral hygiene outreach in rural areas. So um, Augustina, let's please welcome her and please um, begin. Okay, thank you very much. I am Augustina, as I've been introduced, and I would want to share my experience on maternal care. Uh, my first pregnancy, I was a teenager in an uh, Ashanti region. I had a smooth pregnancy. and my childbirth, I was beaten with ruler to help push the baby out because I wasn't pushing enough. That was the explanation I was given why I was beaten with a ruler. I had a baby and I waited for about 12 years to have my second baby. When I got pregnant with my second child in 16 weeks, I had a miscarriage, which wasn't explained to me. In about a year later, I got pregnant again because of the experience of a miscarriage. I decided to go for antenatal early when I went, I, w I went when I was 10 weeks, I was told I can only start when I'm 16 weeks. When I went to 16 weeks, procedures were done, I was checked and, and I was supposed to come back in 20 weeks. But in 19 weeks, I had a miscarriage again. And it was a terrible one because I had to spend the whole night at the teaching hospital when nurses were there and nobody was really minding me until I had to go off, like I collapsed before. When I woke up, I was told I lost the pregnancy. So I had two miscarriages. So the third pregnancy, I, I was scared to go back to the same place. So I discussed with a friend who is a midwife who introduced, introduced me to a very wonderful person. He's a gynecologist. He's called Dr. Timothy Selinyame of Legon Hospital. I am so grateful to him because he has walked me through a journey of three pregnancies and he has been so wonderful. In my third pregnancy, I was a student then. It was a lot of stress. I realized that I had pregnancies induced hypertension and diabetes. I was on medication for both until I went for antenatal and the nurse told me I had acute stomach. It didn't really sink well with me because I know gestational age has to go with the height of the stomach. So I spoke to my friend again, she's called Sheila Deka, and she asked me to speak to my gynecologist. I called him the same day and I was admitted. When I took a scan, I realized I had oligos hydrominos. So it wasn't just that my stomach was cute, but something was wrong. 
I felt bad because as a midwife, I was expecting her to know that when the stomach is reduced, that means um, I've lost like or something is wrong. But that wasn't the, the situation. I was on admission for some time and at 33 weeks, we had to take the baby out because the oligo wasn't correcting. I lost that baby two days after delivery. It was a terrible time for me because that was the third time I was losing a baby. One at 16 weeks, one at 19 weeks, and then a live baby, but died after two days. So surprisingly, my midwife and my gynecologist counseled me a lot. He told me it wasn't the end of the world. Then he had to let me go through um, pregnancy. He educated me on pregnancy and then hypertension. I had to see a psychologist. We went around it. So I got pregnant again. So this time I had read a bit about pregnancy and hypertension and then pregnancy and diabetes. So when I was about 12 weeks, then I realized my sugar had come up again. So we started treating it in and out. Hypertension was up and down, but I was really monitored now. I was monitored because I knew about it. I'm a health personnel. But one thing I, I noticed in all the three hospitals I have been is patients are not educated about the hypertension status. We only go, it's a routine. They check your blood pressure. If it's high, go and rest for 30 minutes or 20 minutes and come back and let's check again. If it's too high, okay, today is too high. So you have to go and see a doctor. You go and he explains to you that, oh, okay, because the BP is high, you have to put your medication. But at the point, I, I feel like um, there should be an education for pregnant women to know that when you have these signs, when these things, you see these things, it's it's a red mark. You should alert them. It's not, you shouldn't only educate us on when we are in labor. Throughout our work in the pregnancy, we should know some things. My second pregnancy, it was really monitored because I've had two miscarriages and one stillbirth. So it was really monitored. I had the baby at 39 weeks through CS and the baby came out with neonatal fracture of the right leg. Wow. Another hassle to go through. We had to um, put him there for two weeks. We had to hang his legs. And through all that, my doctor was still monitoring my BP because he knew I was going through stress that time. He comes to the children's ward to come and see us. He walks out. So we were discharged. And after a year and a half, I got pregnant again. This time, my hypertension started quite early, even though the, um, the sugar was low for a while. It was up and down. I had to change medication because some of the medications were not really working. And when I was, I think, about 26, 27 weeks, then I started having blood visions. So because I had previous issues, I was concerned. The little thing I noted down and I let him know. When I had blood visions, I was at home. Then I just sent him a message that I've been having blood visions. And quickly, he had to call me to come to the hospital on admission. Then he, he said it was preeclampsia. I... I didn't really want to agree with him because I thought I was fine. It was just blur visions, but he was strict on me. Even though he had become a friend, this time he was very strict on me because he said he didn't want me to lose another baby. I went on admission for a week and then I was discharged because everything was fine, but he was monitoring me in and out. Then I think at 32 weeks, I, I got the blood visions again, this time with nauseousness, with a bit of uh, preeclampsia signs. So I, I actually drove myself to the hospital. It's quite a distance. Then when I got there and then my blood pressure was checked, 
it was a bit high. So I had to be admitted again. I stayed there for almost two weeks. Then I came back home. When I was 38, 37, getting to 38, it happened again. And this time I checked my BP in the house Then I realized it was very high. So I called him that night and I had to go back to the hospital. And I was given max sulfates. I was given injections in the tie. And it was being repeated and it's, it's no joke. It's not funny. Like they give the injection and my whole body was on fire. Like I, anytime the injection is given, I feel I am burning up at a point. I, 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 I told them I wanted to write that I, I don't want to take that medicine again, but they said that's the only medication or remedy I have because the way the BP is high, I can lose the baby. The next morning he came to see me and he said, the way things are, we had to take the baby out. I was scared because I took the baby out before 39 weeks or 40 weeks and then I lost the baby. So I, I seriously didn't want to go through that again. So I was actually begging that we had to wait, but he also wasn't taking chances because my, he made me understand that my life is involved. So we had to take that baby out. On the journey of that pregnancy, when I realized because I was a health personnel, I knew about my condition. Some of the nurses were not too comfortable. There was once I eavesdropped on the nurses complaining that like I, I, it looks like because I'm a nurse, I know too much and I'm not leaving them to do their work. I talk too much, but hey, this is my life. I have lost children before. I can't let what happened happens again. So if I ask too much and I, 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 I talk too much. It's because if people haven't even taken time to educate me on my own condition, this is me, I know. What about somebody who doesn't know? There are a lot of people I go and I meet them at Antinental, and they are just dumb about their own condition. They go and their BP is up and it's like, okay, it's because you walked from this distance here, sit down and wait. And there are some of them, I sometimes even want to go and tell them, go and see the doctor. This is Apia. Sorry, uh, one more minute, if you can run. Okay. Up. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. I I had a baby, and then he came out GSPD. He was one through. Now we are being seen by a pediatric doctor who is called Doctor Doebo of Trust Hospital. So on my walk through this journey, there are three people I want to be grateful to: uh, Miss Sheila Deka of Legon Hospital, a midwife. The gynecologist, Dr. Timothy Senunyeme, and a pediatrician. She's called Dr. Adoebo of Trust Hospital. I'm so grateful to them because I have all these my children because of these people. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Augustina, for sharing your story and yeah, allowing us to hear it and witness it. Um, yeah, we really appreciate you. We really appreciate you speaking to us. Um, thank you so much. The okay. next, thank you so much. The next speaker we have is um, our next guest speaker. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Our next patient speaker is Mrs. Olu Oluwakere Olufunke. Um, mother, she is mother of four children two boys and two girls, and she is the school proprietor of Erudite Kids Sand Scholars Academy in Nigeria. So please welcome Mrs. Oluwakere. Oluwakere, are you there? Yes, hello. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Hi, is everyone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, my name is Oluwo uh, Kiri Lufonke. I'm a Nigerian proprietress of Eridai Keys and Scholars Academy, Kubo Abuja. I'm mother of four kids, like said, ranging from 10 to 8 weeks old right now, newborn. 
Now, I'm going to be sharing my medical experience on uh, high blood pressure, which we all know as a pre-eclampsia. And um, my first occurred at, um, uh, on my third baby, when I had my third baby, I, which I had through CS, although through all my four kids are through CS though. So was my third baby after birth, I had a high blood pressure, which was resolved after a few weeks. But during this, the fourth pregnancy, I had a high blood pressure was observed um, as at five months and it continued until my delivery. Sorry, Mrs. Olufunke. I just wanted to ask, can, um, uh, can we see you? Does your video work? Is your video on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's just that I'm, I'm feeding the baby now. <laughs> oh, okay, of course, of course, we understand. Okay, yeah, but yeah, Sorry, however you feel comfortable with, yeah. Okay, don't hold on for me for me, some minutes I can come on. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the discussion, yeah, of course. <laughs> Okay, oh, sorry, you, sorry, for, sorry for interrupting. Okay, so, so I was managed for, uh, uh, I started being managers at that time, and hospital managed me, and uh, throughout that time, my uh, blood pressure continued, and um, the doctor had to keep in a good eye on me. And in the hospital, I had to be checked every week. Every week, our blood pressure will be checked. If it is high, you'll be a red pen will be written on the paper to show that our blood pressure is high. Then which they check our urine also. Our urine also is being checked, so, uh, uh, which will check if the protein is high or not. So the good thing about it is that uh, every, when they noticed my blood pressure increase as a five months and the next visit, it was still high, they ensured that every week I was being given a date to see the doctor, which when I go back home, I was asked to also visit uh, a pharmacy close to me to check my BP every day because I do not have a BP uh, machine at home. So I do check and uh, take uh, notes of all my BP uh, stay, uh, record and take back to the doctor, which the doctor would um, check. And uh, when they realized it was too high, they had to place me on drugs, methodopar, I think, and one other drugs too, to make sure that I'm at least okay to full time. You understand? So then we also, during the, the uh, visits for our antenatal, we always receive health talks from the nurses ranging from nutrition, exercise, things we expect during pregnancy and uh, uh, the after pregnancy, things we should expect during labor and how to care for our babies. And uh, they also teach us songs on how to breastfeed. So all these were those things that we were taught. I'm coming on live now. I think about how sleepy we baby go. So, and, um, uh, okay, let me continue because let me not distract. We were advised not to listen to other, the nurses will tell us not to listen to other people who advise us in, uh, other, in other things that we are not, meant to be for a pregnant woman, such a like some people come in and give you advice prior to the advice the nurses give. Do you understand? So they will ensure that, to, they ensure to tell us that don't listen to them. So they also emphasize on neatness of mothers and uh, uh, patient, uh, neatness of mothers and babies during and after pregnancy. And they also give us exercises, they give us exercises then we have areas that we need to improve in our own hospital, which should um, make us um, a better, uh, to give better uh, what's the services to the patients. Like uh, in my hospital, we have large uh, numbers of patients, which uh, 
they need to work on more facilities for the patients to make use of. So this also makes uh, the nurses to be agitated because of the long patients waiting and they shout at them angrily sometimes, making mothers too, not to get angry and the exchange of words would happen in that uh, uh, aspect. Then during the, during the labor, there's a lack of privacy, especially during physical examination and the general wards. So they lack uh, that. Then I want to talk a bit about my MDoc experience in this, uh, because I was introduced to MDoc during my antenatal. So MDoc is a wonderful, uh, what's it called, platform, a complete health platform that helped me throughout. So they, 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 they supported me in this, my last pregnancy, which I signed up using their support platform, their Telegram, WhatsApp, and um, they engage in frequent monitoring using phone calls, using phone calls and uh, assigned to, I was assigned to a coach who monitors and uh, provides health tips on how to reduce high blood pressure. And the, the, my coach had to tell me how to reduce the intake of salt. And um, also, Oluwakari, we can't, we can't hear you. Did something happen? Mrs. Olufonke. I see her microphone is- Are open. you hearing me? Yes, we can yeah, hear there you. Was a, there was a bit of a break, so we, we, um, we didn't- Okay, the way I was was that, I was like, MDoc, uh, they, my coach who monitored me, she provided uh, health, uh, health tips for me on how to use, uh, uh, how to uh, reduce salt while in the intake of my salt, reduce the oil I take in and also eat good food. And uh, also she indulged me in uh, engaging in periodic medical, periodic checkup on my, um, on my health, that's my BP. Whenever I check, I send also to the MDoc platform, which she monitors and also tells me on what to do. She gave me uh, advice on that. And, uh, I learned a huge lot that um, every mother has the right to complete health, no matter your health condition, no matter who you are, we, uh, we have the right to a complete health. So MDOC was helpful in that aspect to make, uh, make sure that I was confident that there won't be anything that will go wrong while I'm in this pregnancy and which at the end, I was really thankful uh, the end and um, Ms. They, oh, sorry, two, two more minutes, please. Okay, okay. Um, we engage in uh, during the MDOC, uh, this um, complete health. We during the that's on Telegram, we engage in health challenges such as exercise challenge and we stay hydrated. They teach us how to stay hydrated, which uh, is uh, they award us um, and motivate mothers to keep fit and stay healthy during this pregnancy. And lastly, MDOC has been a behavioral uh, health coach. And uh, even though I did not use my coach as, a MDOC, uh, as in that aspect, I know she, a lot of people she helps, she helps in a coping mechanism in anxiety and depression, or anxiety and depression, sorry. So, um, these are my experiences and, and I wish people to know that they have good, uh, great, they have the right to and, and assets to complete health. That's, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Olufonke, for sharing your story, your multiple stories and your work with MDOC. Um, yeah really we really appreciate it and um yeah thank you thank you so much um, so next um we have our guest speaker 
uh, Dr. Veronica Millicent um, Jumeku. Jumeku. Um, sorry, really fast. She is head of the Department of Nursing at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi, Ghana, and is the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. And I've actually read some of her papers specifically on respectful maternity care and midwifery in Ghana. So yes, please let us welcome uh, Dr. Jomeku. Thank you very much for this introduction and the opportunity to share a brief of my journey in respectful maternity care in Ghana. I must say that uh, I can, I empathize with the stories of uh, uh, mothers or patient reporters uh, about respectful maternity care. And uh, that's why my team and I are doing our best and contri to contribute our quota so we can give the best maternity care, respectful maternity care to our clients. By way of introduction, uh, by way of presentation, we will look at a brief introduction and then we will look at the projects that we are undertaking on respectful maternity care, its objectives, the outcomes that we have and what we hope to attain and the findings that we have so far and some policy implications. I should also mention that um, as a project, we have been awarded a five-year um, Oh, we, we can't hear you, Dr. Jomeku. Oh, for some, okay. We have to unmute you. For some reason, you're muted. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. So I am happy to share a brief of our journey on respectful maternity care in Ghana. And by way of um, presentation, we will go through this outline. I also mentioned that I have a five-year uh, grant by the National Institute of Health to work on a study titled Changing the Culture of Disrespect and Abuse in Maternity Care in Ghana, and as part of that um, study, which is an Emerging Leader Award. My mentor is Dr. Jody, Professor Jody Laurie, who is also uh, with us now, joining us from University of Michigan. So for respectful maternity care, generally refers to maternity care that includes any of the following. So if we say we are providing respectful care, the, it is devoid of physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, stigma and discrimination of any sort. The failure, there is no failure to meet professional standards of care. So by that we mean that, um, uh, you know, there are laid down regulations, rules and regulations govern, that govern the practice of nursing and midwifery. So if at any point in time, an individual fails to meet that standard, it is referred to as professional care. There are times that um, midwives or people are attempted to, to use skills that they have acquired with time, which really are not documented. In other words, there's no evidence to support that, that type of care. So if at any point in time you use such a care, or you use such a skill, then you may be providing disrespectful care. For example, um, although I'll be mentioning it later on in this presentation, for all the issues of disrespect that have been reported in literature and which our patients, uh, mother patients have also mentioned uh, this evening, regards um, beating in labor, you know, midwives, reports that uh, 
they, they do that actually to sort of ensure compliance. However, literature does not suggest that so it is disrespectful care and it is, it is condemned in all uncertainties. Um, if there's poor rapport between mother and the practitioner that is also regarded as disrespectful care. And if a woman is confined at any time during the care provision process or period, it is disrespectful. Research have also pointed out uh, health system constraints that also uh, could lead to disrespectful maternity care. So um, we want to look at uh, the purpose and definition of respectful maternity care. So respectful maternity care really focuses on eliminating disrespect or disrespectful care. And it is a type of care that is organized and provided to all women in a manner that maintains their dignity their privacy and confidentiality and ensures freedom from harm and uh, mistreatment and enables informed choice and continuous support during labor and childbirth. So if, this, if the care that is provided is of this nature, then it is respectful care. Now one may ask, is there a link between um, disrespectful maternity care and maternal health outcomes, yes, there is. In our, set, in our setting and elsewhere, it has been reported that uh, once women get to know or figures out that um, the care that is received in a particular facility is disrespectful, they, they refuse to use those facilities in subsequent deliveries. And even in some cases, prefer to deliver at home. And if you listened carefully in, in Madame Augustine's submission, she mentioned that she changed the hospital when she was not too satisfied with the hospital she used at first hand. In other circumstances, they end up delivering at home. And we know that in a certain uh, home beds are devoid of um, essential necessities that could take care of complications that arises in childbirth. We also know that Childbirth um, comes with complications that may not necessarily be detected during antenatal care. And uh, complications that arises in childbirth account for a uh, majority of the mortalities that we have. And for which reason it is important that women deliver in hospital. In our previous studies, we have reported um, patient perspectives on um, care provision, where they reported that they were disregarded, they were beaten, they were shouted at, they were insulted by midwives during childbirth. And again, uh, mothers this evening have mentioned these things. So then we, we our current study, um, which is titled um, Changing the Culture of Disrespect and abuse in maternity care through respectful maternity care training. So in our previous studies, we um, realized that the areas of dissatisfaction and disrespect that the clients had were um, really, really bothers around these four areas. Um, disrespect and loss of dignity in childbirth, lack of communication. And again, they mentioned that um, focused antenatal care. And our clients also mentioned that um, they were unable to come for services, antenatal care, because they spent too much time in the hospital when they come. And we know that um, for most of our clients in our part of the world, they they, they are engaged in uh, either as uh, artisans or selling or so. And so they are not in the formal sector of employment. And so um, uh, any time they spend in the facility meant loss of, uh, loss of revenue to them. They also mentioned the lack of alternative birthing positions in the hospital. So in the hospital, um usually the 
best position that one has, the options that one had was the use of the lithotomy position. That's when the woman lies on her back to deliver her baby. And women were not too happy about this position because they said that at home, if when they had opportunities to deliver at home, they were allowed all at all positions to squat, to stand, et cetera, et cetera. And we know also that, in fact, the, 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 the normal or natural, you know, positions that aid, you know, release of anything from the perineum is a squatting position, and particularly so with childbirth. So these are model centers around these areas uh, in, in order to empower the mid midwives to provide respectful maternity care. We so far have... Um, trained midwives we have trained midwives on these models. We have done a pre and a post evaluation, training evaluation, uh, results of which I will share with you in a few minutes. And we have also followed up on clients, clients who have been taken care of, uh, taken care of by uh, these midwives three months ago. And um, we have very good reports that suggest. That's training on respect. Ah, okay. Hmm. Dr. Jomiku, we can't hear you. Also, just a reminder for those who have entered, please turn off your microphone um, so we can hear the panelists. Thank you so much. Dr. Jomiku? Hey. Thank Are you, you there? Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, yes. We lost you for, for a few seconds. <laughs> okay. So I think I was talking about the models, the models we use for the training. And that was basically uh, based on previous trainings that we have had. Following that, we have trained midwives on the model. We have followed up with um, uh, women that have received care from these trained midwives. And uh, these women speak very well about um, how satisfied they are with the care they received, how communication was perfect, how uh, they felt respected and received dignified care during those processes. And um, we are still training midwives and collecting data with the hope to develop a disrespectful maternity care skill from the perspective of the midwives. Um, so as findings from uh, the midwives suggest that the midwives are aware of this respectful care that is being provided. And the two broad factors that comes up under this respectful care are the socioeconomic inequalities of the clients mm -hmm. and also institutional structures and processes within the facilities where they work. The midwives also mention that they have they have um, observed, they have been preview to this res disrespectful care being meted uh, out to clients. Uh, in some few cases, they mentioned that they, they themselves have been uh, the ones meting out this, this disrespectful care and it's sp they specifically talk about um, neglecting, shouting, restraining, and hitting childbearing women. However, the midwives mentioned that they do all of this with a positive intent, a life saving intent. You know, especially when they, you know, the, they, they want the woman to push the baby out because at that point they feel that the, the, the baby, they might lose the baby if there is any further delay in pushing the baby out, although that is not the right thing to do. Now, socioeconomic inequalities also drive disrespectful maternity care. And some of the marginalized group of women who suffer this are the non-compliant women. And a woman is considered non-compliant if, uh, for example, she's asked to push, whereas she thinks that is all the effort she could put in, the midwife considers that not being inadequate. So it could be a room for 
uh, receiving a disrespectful care, they're mentally ill, they're marginalized, basically to say, a woman who has HIV is the teenager. And uh, you would hear, um, recall that uh, Augustina mentioned that uh, in her first baby, when she had as a teenager, she received some slaps. Yes, and uh, the, the poor and the, the childbearing woman in the general world. Yes, we realize that um, the setting in which the woman is receiving care also had a role to play in whether she received respectful or disrespectful care. Uh, so in this general world, you, you know, the, the, the world is so choked and um, the client to patient, uh, midwife ratio is very high. So you have one midwife taking care of a very large number of patients. And so they do not receive the attention that they should, should, they should get. Again, we realize that these same midwives, if they, when we followed them up to the private wards, you know, the care that the clients are giving there and that they receive there were very satisfactory for the clients. And so the setting, the environment also had a role to play in whether the woman was uh, satisfied with the care she received or not. So- One more uh, minute, sorry, four more minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So the job distress, as I have mentioned, the unrealistic staff to childbearing woman ratio, midwife to client ratio had a role to play. The infrastructure of the hospital that does not really allow the use of any other position but for the lithotomy position. And then lack of resources in some situations, the, um, um, having a curtains or yes, to provide a privacy was not adequate. They were just not available to ensure adequate privacy for all of the clients. And that ended up in this respectful maternity care. The midwives uh, recommended that, um, um, they, they mentioned really that um, the training they received on this respectful maternity care improved their relationship with their client. Subsequently, the concern they have and the overall, for the overall, uh, the, their clients, and uh, the need to respect the autonomy of their client. They recommended therefore that the training should cover every staff of the hospital, even the non-health staff, even the supporting staff should re receive this training. Um, going forward, we recommend that the hospital should provide adequate logistics to ensure that um, this um, respectful maternity care could be provided, adequate resources and logistics, and also the policies on the, of, in some of the hospital, which suggests or that if a client does not settle the bills, she should not be allowed to go. And I want to, enforce that, that, that uh, law policy is the midwife. So then it leads to restricting or restraining the client, which also accounts for this respect for care. We also suggest that the infrastructure in the hospitals, you know, should be made um, private. You know, we should have private units. In such situations, the clients can have a, uh, her partner with her, the client have, can have a very significant person with her. But as it stands now in an open world, it is difficult to admit any other person into the delivery room with the clients. Um, we also uh, recommend that the hospital or the facilities um, Put, put measures in place that ensures that respectful maternity care is provided and does not leave it, uh, you know, uh, you know, open. So measures are in place that so that when the client receives any disrespectful care, the client could report to the facility. And when that is done, uh, appropriate measures could be taken. I, we believe this could serve as a, a 
a, a deterrent to those who do not provide uh, respectful maternity care. And, and then the staffing. Client to midwife ratios are very high, very, very high. That is a very strong point in um, deter, you know, it serves as a, a challenge in providing respectful maternity care. And we will recommend that the staff client ratio improves so that clients can receive respectful maternity care. So we have some of our published work that uh, are online we have here for you to look at later on. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Jomiku. Um, and I want to also thank all of our panelists for their informative um, and their emotional stories and presentations. So we have about 30 minutes left um, of, the, of the webinar, but um, this is the time for question and answers. So if you have a question, um, you can set it in the chat, chat box or you can raise your hand um, and ask, um, and then we'll call on you to ask questions directly to our panelists. I do recall um, there being one question in the chat box from Elizabella Garty um, asking Dr. Jomiku if she could elaborate on the cultural dimension of respectful maternity care. Okay, so, um... Culturally, uh, childbirth is not an individual process. Mm -hmm. So in our setting here, childbirth is a whole community. It goes even beyond the family process. And so you would expect that uh, the, the, the community or the family at least should be allowed in. But as I mentioned, uh, the childbirth in our health facilities does not allow that. One, we do not have private rooms to allow for, for the party to be with, with, with her, uh, his wife. And so she, she goes through that process alone. Again, while she goes through it alone, she doesn't have you know, the, the, the attention of the midwife or the caregiver that is present because that caregiver was overwhelmed taking care of a whole lot of other women. So you have this family sitting behind the, 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 the uh, the room or the hospital sitting outside and wondering what is going in. And uh, you have this health provider also, you know, all over herself sometimes and unable to give information as quickly as she should to them to explain maybe that things are going this way or that way. Everything is in order. So, you know, keep still. So they see, they may see her going up and down and, you know, are left figuring out what the situation might really be. But culturally, for us, if she were at home, she would receive all of this attention, which is, is considered very essential in our culture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jomeku. I see Josephine uh, has a question. Uh, Josephine Asuo, I'm gonna ask you to unmute um, if you wanna ask a question directly to our panelists. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jomeku, for your presentation. Please, I want to find out um, this respectful maternity care that you described, looking at the various dimensions, um, looking at the structural challenges that most of our facilities have, even the cultural dimension, where some women um, based on their culture, they don't need to expose themselves so much. Giving birth in a, a facility where there are other women and a lot of care providers is a challenge. Is there any way forward for um, midwives attending to home births in Ghana in regards with this respectful maternity care? Thank you. Thank you, Josephine, for your question. Yes, there's all there, there's a way. Um, however, in our current situation, uh, I'm not too sure whether we 
we are ready to provide that. Why? Because um, the facilities are quite uh, distant, you know, from the communities or the, the setting that we are, such that if um, in the events of providing home care, there is a challenge, you know, it will take a while to get to the hospital. Having said that, if we should if we should do home deliveries or conduct home deliveries now, then we should ensure that we have uh, uh, the facilities informed. You know, we are emergency prepared, such that if we have informed a gynecologist, we have informed the facility, such that in the event that anything occurs, we could quickly link up with the hospital to avoid the delay. It shouldn't be the case that at a point when the action should be taken or the intervention should be taken, we are now going to find a vehicle that transports the client to the hospital because our ambulance services in, in, in the country are also not the best. So yes and no. If we have to do it, then we have to ensure that we are emergency prepared for, for it. Thank you. Thank you, Josefina and Dr. Jomoku. Sorry, excuse me. I, so there were some um, other people raising their hands in the beginning. And um, I wrote down Josephine Tente and Judith Austin. And I was wondering if they had questions um, that they wanted to ask or that was something unrelated. Also, um, I didn't get the last name, but Jemima also raised their hand and I wanted to know if they wanted to any, ask questions directly to our panelists. Kendra, yes, please. Um, yes, ask your question. Um, and uh, up next, we'll, uh, Dr. Alex will ask after, but um, Kendra, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and you can ask your question directly to the panelists. Hi everyone. Um, so it's more of a comment than a question. Uh, and, and thank you to everybody um, who has spoken today, both the patients, um, um, you know, the two ladies we, we heard today and um, the speaker. It's more when we talk about respectful maternal care in, especially in the African setting, you know, our, and we do surveys, most times our surveys don't capture the depth of the problem um, because there is such a low expectation um, from the women receiving care. Like a, a lot of women, a lot of us don't know what, um, you know, our rights. And so when we're giving tokenisms, you know, tokens of res respectful maternal care, then we feel, you know, really um, happy about it. So it's, um, I know that we have come a long way from where we used to be, but there's still room for improvement, like many of the uh, moms, um, you know, have shared and our speaker has also shared. Um, one, one thing, you know, in, in talking about that lack of emotional support from the woman's husband, we're once supporting some work somewhere in Africa and they tried to get the husbands to come in, but, you know, did not do the pre-work of educating the husbands and preparing them, either the husbands or the mother-in-laws. So they became a barrier they would come in and start feeling fainty, you know, want to faint or, or no, you can't give that episode to me. You can't cut my, my daughter. You can't call my wife. So again, in how we do these things, we have to be innovative um, around, you know, how we can, yes, is a general um, hospital, is a general ward, but we can still provide um, you know, privacy. We might not be able to have ward screens in between, but you know, some hospitals have been innovative to use the curtains, you know, so just think outside the box around how can we contextualize it that we're still giving, um, you know, respectful maternal care, even with our challenges on the continent. And empowering women really to know what their rights are so that they demand for this, to, because till that demand starts happening more frequently, um, they will still be gushing and saying thank you for someone, for a doctor or nurse greeting them.
Thank you so much, Kendra. Um, Dr. Alex, uh, you raised your hand next. Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you, organizers, and thank you, everybody, for wonderful presentation. Um, I think some few observations uh, I've made um, uh, in my past, I'm a physician gynecologist anyway, uh, working in the police hospital, also from my colleague. And I had a serious experience in the United Nations in South Sudan. I realized that there are women uh, who were educated before uh, childbed uh, came to the neighborhood were more likely to cooperate and therefore were less likely to be stressful on their attendance, yeah, that's either the midwife or the physician gynecologist in the neighborhood, and they are less likely to have any of sex abuse. Because you realize that uh, most of sex abuse come from one, a child uh, health worker at the labor ward. Because if somebody has been there doing two or three deliveries at the same time, if you look at our session, uh, not even at the kitchen, but if you look at the chip compound or the dishes hospital, for instance, you may have one midwife attending to like three or four people at the same time in labor. So she's not going to give you uh, that at time. You will not get all that time for one person who is uh, uh, giving that, let me put in the question, that hell of a time around that time of the day. And I realized that uh, most of the time, third trimester, where we are supposed to actually coach or educate the uh, prospective uh, pregnant women who will come to deliver, to go through signs of labor, the onset of labor, and then even how long will you it should even take uh, in the labor world. You have not actually done uh, that education. And you realize that those who are really educated tell you, look, you have to dilate up to 10 p.m. before you, uh, you, you can probably push. We are, uh, we're able to uh, cooperate. But most of the time, also, uh, the people are shouting, trying to look for sympathy, where in actual fact, the shouting is not even going to help them. Because they're in a, a place where they don't know anybody. Everybody looks the same. They, they can't distinguish between a doctor, they can't distinguish between a midwife or a health aide or even a cleaner. They call anybody. So sometimes, the person they even come, I know even be a midwife, but they think, oh, the midwife, they call midwife, they don't even uh, mind them. So it's up to us, one, to do the education, not uh, uh, apart from general education that needs to be done in the country or in the community, per se. But individually, as antenatal, people should be educated at their trimester, what they expect in the neighborhood. Uh, so that they see people who come to like non-attendance or deported will be able to probably handle them with their uh, care. And also the institutions that we work to make sure that things are available for the midwives to work. Because, or even the uh, gynecology, because everybody gets frustrated around that time and sometimes the, probably the client become like the person at the receiving end. If vacuum is not working, there's no max free, there's no hydrolysis, and somebody's GP is 180 over something, you are frustrated. And sometimes, too, the outcome of uh, confidential inquiry into a uh, maternal and uh, maybe child death, if uh, there was a midwife or a physical gynecologist at, uh, attendant to when yes, a baby was lost or a mother was lost, it depends on how the communication was given. If the person was, let me put in quotes, lambasted or uh, made to feel like it was in all his fault, the next time it meets a caring like that, it's just a way of punishing. Like, look, I don't want this thing to happen to me. This is my reputation as king. I don't want the baby to die as it. So when the woman is not pushing, there's already a panic and she wants to do everything to get a baby who is not as rejected. So also the way we communicate or handle the outcome of confidential inquiry to really also uh, help. And I think it's a multifactorial, and uh, we need to address it in different uh, dimensions, both individual uh, level, patient side, and also the uh, institutional side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alex. I just wanted to know if um, any of our panelists had uh, something to, to add to what he said, or... There is, um, uh, Dr. Brecker de Kock did have a question in the chat box. Am I, am I incorrect, <laughs> Dr. Kock? No, okay. All right. Um, any other uh, questions, please raise your hand now um, or send it in the, ch in the chat. 
I, I personally had a question for one of our patient speakers. Um, Augustina, are you still there? Yes, um, I am. Hi, Augustina, how are you? So I just wanted to ask a question. You, you brought up the fact that um, in your experience, it was an issue, your profession, that they, that they thought you, you said knew too much um, and that, that interfered with, with uh, the care you were receiving. Did yeah. you, who did you receive that from? Who exactly? And, um, you know, uh, uh, was, it, was it related to, to <laughs> all of your pregnancies that that, that, that that also was brought up as an issue or, or specific ones? I just wanted you to speak a little bit about that. Okay, so on my, when I last pregnancy, I went on admission twice before delivery. So the last one I was given mass sulfate, like I said, and I wasn't too comfortable with the drug because of the heat rashes it was giving me. Then I I told them, okay, so I'll take it. They had to wait for some time and I, I knew I, I, am, I am hypertensive and I wanted it to wait a bit. And she, it became an argument between the two of us because she feels like, okay, if I didn't know anything about my medication or my condition, I wouldn't be arguing with her. It's because I know that is why I am trying to argue with her over it. And that's if I am a health personnel, I am a dental nurse. Oh, oh, ask me. Uh, Agustina, you first, you're some reason on, on mute again. Can we unmute you? There we go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So she she was telling me that I am a health personnel. I am an I am a dental nurse. She is a midwife, so I can't tell her what to do. So I told I actually refused to take treatment from her until I, and I was given a different midwife to take care of me. But my argument is, I I believe patients should know the risk involved in their pregnancies. They should, they should know their red flags. They should know that if I see this in my pregnancy, it's a red flag for me, I should report it. But they just go with, and then I know when I go, they check my BP, they check my urine, sometimes check my blood and I go home. The education is not there, that just like Dr. Akon was saying. If the education is there, they won't even walk in calling uh, an oddly as a midwife or a doctor, because here most of us wear scraps when we are in the surgeries. So if the education is done, they would know who and who to call upon when they are in trouble. If the education is done, they won't stay home to lose their babies before they come inside. If the education is done, when the person's BP is high, even without checking, you will know that you have palpitations, you had, you have blevishings, you'll be vomiting and all that, you know, but because they are not, the education is not done when we are pregnant or it's not done nationwide or worldwide. Uh, we end up losing a lot of children or a lot of mothers because we don't, we don't have an education. Thank you. Thank you, Augustina. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Jomeku, I saw you were nodding a lot. Do you want to? Do you have anything to say about um, uh, Augustina's experience? Yes. Um, education. Yes. Um, you know, I mentioned lack of communication as one of the key factors that we uh, that came up in our in our studies. Um, so, um, it's either the, the 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 care is given but the client is not told what the findings are or a decision needs to be taken after the clients have been assessed and the client doesn't feel involved adequately enough or that the client, it's it, it assumed that this is something the client should know. And so a second step is taken, you know, you should know this. So the next step we are doing now is to intervene so education, yes, education at all levels of the um, of the of the obstetric cycle through antenatal, so they know what to expect even in labor and uh, after delivery is very important. And involvement of the client in every decision that is taken, that will go a long way to 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 help. And uh, again, Dr. Akon made a very uh, rare quote what I said about uh, the staff. Uh, patient ratios. Mm -hmm. They are really very high at certain points in time. That does not afford 
um, you know, giving adequate attention to, to individual clients. And uh, that leads to, you know, patients feeling neglected in some cases. And again, the basic facilities in some situations, like Dr. Akon mentioned, you know, having even the screen to provide the pri privacy that is expected in the general world become an issue. Yes, all of this. And then conscientizing the midwives and all health professionals about the need to provide respectful maternity care. It's, it's, a, it's not as if they do not know, but you know, the wrong things have be almost become a norm now. That now there is the need to, to re-echo re and reconscientize mm -hmm. and redirect re re redirect the, the, the whole issue of maternity care in these days, knowing that the care that we provide is very essential to reducing maternal mortality rates in, in our countries. Thank you. Thanks, Agustina, and thanks, Dr. Jomiku. Um, Koiwa, uh, the executive director of APEC Ghana, uh, she has a question. She got, uh, Koiwa, did you want to ask directly to the panelists? Hello, hi. Yes, I just wanted to um, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. I just wanted to share a brief experience and also um, ask a, a question. So, I, I, for one, I'm a four-time survivor of preeclampsia, eclampsia and health syndrome. I have one surviving child out of four pregnancies. In my last experience, which was specifically in April 2020, I had to go through, you know, an emergency CS because I developed severe preeclampsia again, and my baby actually died after three days coming out alive. But after delivery, when I was there, I... They, realized I had developed the HELP syndrome, so I had to be, you know, monitored. And in one of those routines where the nurses, you know, come and check your medicine, and, you know, in our, it was a public institution, so the nurses come on shift and they go. And I was in a private room, nonetheless, but it was still a general ward. And at a point, I needed to call the nurse, you know, to help me with something. And so I just kept on... I think at that time, the night nurse had come in. It was a team of night nurses, and my bed was actually close to the reception. So I just kept on calling nurse, nurse, you know, Madam Midwife, in my weak state with the little strength that I had. Even though by my bed there was something that I had to click to call them, I did that and nothing. For close to about 20 minutes, there was no nurse appearing. You can imagine if it was an emergency situation, I would have been gone then. Then the nurse came. And I was like, I've been calling you, you know, what is, what is, what is it? And she was like, oh, but we just came in and we are changing. And I said, yes. And, you know, and I was like, I, I was quite not happy with her conduct. I was like, I'm not happy with what you're doing. You know, I've been calling for so long now. And so she just gave me an attitude and I ignored it. So not long, I think just a few minutes after the, she came in with a doctor you know, to do some checkups and thing. And I did tell the doctor in front of her. And then she got a bit defensive and agitative and told her, well, doctor, well, please take care of my case or my care because she's complaining, you know, that she, you know, she called us and we didn't respond and all that. And so she was given attitude right in front of myself, the patient and the doctor who is supposed to be, you know, not superior, but I mean, they work together. But the doctor did not say anything, just went on to do his job and then, you know, left after. And what I realized after the doctor left was that I was at the care of this nurse and her team overnight. If she had a problem with me, it means that she wasn't going to pay attention to me as I should get it because of her attitude and many other things. And 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 it displayed, you know, if, if, she, if she probably had to check on three times i felt she would do it she would do it just two times and if she had to administer medicine to me it would just be in a cheeky mood so i felt vulnerable at that moment that if i do not um suppress my grievance and pretend that if i'm okay with this nurse i'm going to have a tough night so that is what i did i ended up when she came out to administer one medicine fully found you know trying to take some notes and i told her oh um, she should just forgive me and that, you know, I just lost my child and I'm quite in a frustrated mood and it's just that I need her help. So she should just let it go. And I hope, you know, she's able to administer the care that I need. When I said that, she, she just nodded her head and she said, okay. So then following that, you could see a change of attitude, mood and care towards me. 
and 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 this to me has been one of my experiences and so it just baffles my mind that when we are at the care of you know nurses midwives and clinicians i mean our life are in your hands at the point that we are in the hospital but we are helpless you know, and we are in such a condition that some of it we can't control. And I believe that irrespective, they still need to maintain professionalism, whatever the case of the that the patient may be, whether the patient is grumpy, whether the patient, in my opinion, when it comes to administering healthcare, the patient is always right. I mean, not in terms of their diagnosis, but whatever it is that they are feeling, you need to be able to address it, you know, with respect, no matter what it is, because you don't touch me anyhow just because I know that without you, I'm helpless. And then, you know, I'm just there feeling the pain and all that. So that's just my humble submission. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So much, Hi. Hello. Doc. Can you, who is this? It's Abdul Hakim, please. Okay. Hi. Do you have a question? Uh, I have some contributions and some questions to ask. Okay. Yes, of course, yes. for sure. Um, after this question, we have one more um, question that was posted on the, the chat um, about a few minutes back that I want to get to, and then we'll, we'll move on to close. So we are um, running a bit behind, maybe about um, uh, five to 10 minutes behind. So um, hopefully you can all stay for, for the closing and the end. Um, so we'll wrap up in about um, three minutes for questions. Okay. So um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I, I didn't know how they made the co-host, but I accept the role and I'm admitting other participants on the on the program. Okay. okay. So um, I, I come from uh, the north uh, in Upper East region in Zebula to be more precise. I have been a nurse for the past 10 years and now a physician assistant in 10. And I have observed a lot of gaps. <laughs> a lot of gaps in the training that makes a nurse, in the training that makes a midwife, and in all the lines of health, as we see in current trends, as in some of these situations that we are battling. I'm so emotional as I'm, as I'm hitting on this. You see, um, vital signs, as I've been made to understand from training, it's, 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 we have routine vital signs, and we have vital signs that has just so important that we keep the patient's health on track. Look, we have situations on our wards that the nurse who has gone to chat the vital signs of a client, I mean, check it, has come to chat and is chatting it wrongly. The concept of what you are even going after at the bedside of the patient is seemingly lost. And this is, this is the biggest problem I've always had and I will continue to have because people just go fix something, chat it on the folder, and they are done. So the whole training needs to be looked, looked at. It's, it, we should deviate from letting people learn more about the textbook, but rather go into the field, the practical thing to know that the essence of checking somebody's blood pressure is, is, is to prevent the dire consequences. But so sadly, as we see, the training on the, in, on the classroom is far greater than that of the practical field. We are always told that when you go to the ward, you would know, you would know what? Those on the ward are there working at that moment. How many minutes can they devote to get you to understand the very essence of the vital signs that you are chatting? So I, I, I want the training to be re-looked really at. Honestly, uh, it, it, it breaks my head. Then I, I, my little observation working in the CHIPS compound in the health center is with this. The patient, the, 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 the pregnant woman's ANC card, okay? The ANC card has vital information that need to be checked in. But we see patients at the CHIPS level and when we are referring, we cannot write just two, three lines of what we have done on that patient in the ANC card, as, as, I mean, to, to, to supplement for the little space that is on the referral card for the next referral level to know what we have, we have exactly done. And so the patient seems to be living from the lowest center to the, the, next, the next highest center 
with, with, with scanty information written just only on a referral, referral booklet. I mean, referral paper. And so when, when you get to the health center or, or to the hospital, we, 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 don't, we don't get much. I mean, we, we are not so worried in that we, we fetch much information to know where exactly we should go with such clients. So in, in fact, it's, it's sad, but well, this is coming to help open more eyes and then to get our midwives, our students, our, I mean, in order that we, we up our game, knowing that I, I would like, in, in addition to this program, we look at how we should concentrate on the interpretation of vital signs in women, with, I mean, in women with pregnancy. We should hit the midwives hard with this concept because they just chat and, and they go. I mean, I, I could be a victim sometime back, but now I understand that no, there's more to it than just going after and checking the figures. So this is my little submission. And my question is actually, um, is this program, uh, I mean, is it, is, it, is, it, is it nationwide? Because I want to request, if, if it is not, then please let's see how it can get down north, because th there are a lot of gaps here. It's it's it's, it's my my question request. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdul. We, yeah, really appreciate yeah your talking about your experience um, as well as your question. Um, really important one in terms of uh, yeah uh, geography and access and uh, privilege and yeah what you know where the money lies. Um, I uh, We need to wrap up because we're a little bit behind and we wanna respect everyone's time as well as the panelists time. Um, so I just wanted to, to um, uh, I need to share, sorry. So if you have questions, yeah, um, we'll, we will compile them and, and maybe there's a way we can answer them or you know, you can, you can keep them and um, ask them for the, for the, for our next session. Um, but let me just share really fast. Uh, okay. So sorry, we saw these beginning questions before. Um, and we wanted to ask um, before we close, um, and this is something you can can uh, type in the chat or um, reflect on um, after the series, but this is something that, yeah, we'll just answer one question, two questions, all questions, but just kind of to, to brainstorm along with us uh, before we end the webinar. So some of our closing session questions are, what do you think the barriers and challenges to respectful maternity care are? Um, what are the ways to enhance or facilitate respectful maternity care? And kind of a more specific question, um, what are the ways to enhance or facilitate communication between health providers and patients or clients as part of respectful maternity care? Um, so we'll give you uh, one to two minutes to, um, to, to answer in the chat uh, and kind of, um, yeah, clo close this amazing panel. I also, I also encourage, um, if no one wants to answer in the chat, which is totally fine, I also encourage maybe our panelists um, maybe to answer one or two question, thinking along with us about the solutions. I know Dr. Jomik, who kind of spoke about that, um, as well as Augustina and Mrs. Um, uh, Ogufunke. Uh, okay, we have from Susan, provide more training and compassionate care. And Regina's answering as well. I think someone in the chat brought up power imbalances, really thinking through that.
incorporating RMC, according to Josephine, incorporating RMC into our midwifery training, incredibly important. I think so from someone who, who brought up an experience from MDOC, um, also thinking of, thinking innovatively was another kind of solution and response, really thinking about um, respectful maternity care and how to go about it through a, a critical and innovative lens. I'll just give about one more minute to uh, answer the questions or just, you can always, yeah, just leave with them as well. Patient says, health professional, especially nurses and midwives, need more workshop on holistic care and attitudinal training. Wow. So again, Isabella kind of um, con uh, conferring and concurring about reevaluating midwifery education, thinking about barriers to RMC as a lack of resources. And Gina, really important, and I think that's part of our seminar, our webinar as well, that um, really connects listening to all these stories, these stories from, from our patient speakers and really attending to that. Very much a part of enhancing maternal, respectful maternity care and um, also part of you know, eradicating those barriers. Wonderful, everyone. No tokenism, yes, I love it. And communication also being a, a, a solution, listening, listening both ways. So I just wanna extend my gratitude to everyone who attended today's webinar. It was my first time hosting. And so I hope I did a good job, but I really wanna extend my, again, also my gratitude to our patient speakers, Augusti Augustina Efriam and Mrs. Oluwereke Alufunke and Dr. Jomeku. Um, really informative, inspiring, and yeah, really, you guys are asking amazing questions in, in the chat. Oh, I, I really wish we had more time. We should have more time for discussion and answer next time. So much to discuss, so much to talk about. Um, a lot of crowdsourcing here, a lot of brain source, sourcing here with all of us. So um, a few quick announcements before you go. If you need a certificate of participation for accreditation, um, the certificate um, and registration form has been uh, sent in the chat. Um, and we also would really like to ask, um, and we would really appreciate if you had the time to fill in um, our feedback form um, about our webinar. And uh, yes, we really, really would like to hear kind of, yeah, what you think we can do better, what you'd like to see, um, think through with us. Um, additionally, um, so yeah, the links are provided in the chat right now. And we just wanted to, um, uh, point you to some upcoming webinars, specifically our Respectful Maternity Care series, which this was the first um, series. Our second series is taking place um, Friday, November 13th. Um, and that will be on the theoretical framework and the WHO approach to respectful maternity care. And the respectful maternity care series, um, the third series on the 27th, uh, will uh, be on the perspectives from the perspectives of midwives. Um, and we also have another patient uh, learning series coming up. So Koiwa, I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, welcome you to to talk about how to sponsor APEC Ghana um, as the executive executive director of the organization. Koiwa? Hello, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Sasha. Okay. So just as you know, APEC Ghana is an NGO. And so everything we do here is for free. It's, you know, non-profit making, but, you know, to get our work going, if for whatever reason you want to support us so that we can keep these um, programs and activities going, you can do so as um, put on the slide. You can volunteer your time and expertise as a nurse, irrespective of your your location, we are always looking for regional coordinators, district coordinators whom we can work with 
so that we, uh, we can extend our program to the local and the grassroots. You can also equally follow us on social media so that we can grow in numbers. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also equally sponsor and collaborate with any of our upcoming programs in whatever contribution form that you want to do and the details are there in terms of where you can send your contributions and for any questions kindly send us an email and then we will respond accordingly thank you sasha thank you koiwa and lastly we just want to thank our webinar planning team members um, as well as those who assisted administratively um, and organized this webinar session including um, koiwa of course but um, dr clartia uh, and uh, dr brown and dr Kolk. Um, and again, uh, just to give thanks to our partners and collaborators in this series, Spot the Spot Study, the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, MDoc, MDoc, excuse me, Quick Medical Consult, and to all of you who are participating, joining, and really um, engaging uh, in the webinar series today. And again, thank you so much, um, McCrow and Odo. Odabo. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yes, look forward to seeing you at the next session. I love it. <laughs> bye bye.